Welcome to Loop TV. I'm your host, Gene Munster. Our topic today is 2022 predictions. I'm joined by Doug Clinton, Loop's our own Doug Clinton. Happy New Year, Doug. Happy New Year to all of you on this final day of 2021. And we at Loop have made a tradition of making predictions in the upcoming year. Uh, we agree on what these predictions all are. Uh, however, there is a philosophical point I'd like to quickly start on before uh, we get going here, which is the concept of predictions. Are they worthwhile when it comes to investing? Doug, would love your take. I know you've got a unique contrarian view on predictions. It'd be a fun place to start. Yeah, I've always felt predictions are a little bit silly. And, it, you know, the end of the year, it's a fun time to think about what can happen next. Uh, but to me, you know, the, the year is just sort of a marker of time that we pay attention to. And there's no different, you know, scenario really three or four weeks ago versus what we're looking at today. So you could just as easily say, well, our predictions are uh, starting at the end of November, 2021, they go to the end of November, 2022. It's all sort of arbitrary. And so for me, as I think about predictions and when I see predictions in financial media, I think about them more just as pure ideas that we all need to do our work on. And ultimately, we're all trying to make smart investments, which comes back to value that companies generate. That's ultimately what comes out in the share price. Makes sense and agree with that. You got to get it right. So here we are. We're, we'll just look at the hypothetical calendar that starts on January 1st uh, and think about what we now think will happen over the next 12 months. I'll start with a prediction related to FANG. We spent a lot of time uh, researching and studying in big tech. And uh, this year uh, we are predicting that Apple and Facebook uh, will duel it out for the top performing FANG stock. Uh, we've talked about a fracturing of FANG. Uh, that has happened. We saw the outperformance in 2021 coming from Google and Apple. And in 2022, we think it's going to be Apple and Facebook. Uh, the reason is the metaverse. And there's been a substantial amount of hype around the metaverse, but there is a flight to quality we expect in 2022. The volume, the noise around the metaverse, we think will continue to rise. And we think that there'll be this flight to quality with bigger tech names. We saw the same thing in the EV space in 2021, where the top three EV companies uh, were up 220%. If you look at their uh, uh, last private rounds through uh, the end of 2021, where the next uh, basically 10 were down 45%. And so this massive flight to quality, even though EVs was a huge theme, uh, we kind of see the same thing happen in the metaverse of flight to quality and Facebook and Apple will participate in that. And I'll kind of draw forward the another uh, prediction here that relates to uh, this top fang uh, expectation, which is uh, we are in the consensus group that Apple will showcase, not ship, but showcase an MR headset, mixed reality headset in 2022. We think it's going to be at the June WWDC, the developer conference. And this is a big deal. And I wanted to bring you and Doug and uh, hear just a little bit about, uh, let's just kind of fast forward at, and say we are correct on this prediction that Apple does show a mixed reality headset. Why does it matter? I think it has to give a boost to the industry. I, I sort of remember the Apple Watch. I mean, Apple Watch was not the first smartwatch that was in the market. Google uh, through Android had several watches. I remember a Samsung watch, but the idea of a wrist-worn wearable really didn't take off until Apple brought theirs to market. So I think that Apple sort of lends legitimacy to these big themes when they say we're gonna do something, they usually do it with pretty strict intention. And so I think for them to make a headset or at least announce that they have one coming, I think it would say that, you know, they're, they're going to start to make that thing mainstream, just like we saw with the watch. Agree. And it is a new product category. The watch, as a reminder, took several years before it really gained traction. I think it's probably the same in, in terms of some form of a wearable. But that was our, our second uh, prediction. Moving along uh, to the EV, we think that the theme of EVs is going to cool off. I kind of framed in what the performance was of the, the biggest three that would be Tesla, Lucid, and Rivian. 
in 2021. Again, the Rivian and Lucid uh, starting points so that 220% average uh, started at a private, their last private rounds at the beginning of 2021. And uh, we'd love your take, Doug, on, on this uh, thematic prediction around EVs. I think, well, there's one thing we've talked a lot about at Loop, which is this idea that whatever big theme, and again, we'll go back to the arbitrary calendar year, but whatever big theme worked in the year prior, it doesn't often work two years in a row. And particularly in tech where things get heated before there's really substance there. I mean, to me, you look at the, the EV space and you expand it even to broader auto OEMs and Ford was up 130% last year. That was uh, actually a call that we had made uh, relative to one of our other products, our Frontier Tech uh, Index that we have an ETF built around. Um, we said that Ford would outperform Tesla and that has proven true. But if you look across the entire auto OEM industry, I mean, the market cap of all auto is probably up something like 100% year over year. And I think you just see things like that happening and EVs are still a very small percentage of the market. To me, there's not enough meat behind the actual uh, financial numbers in these companies to justify that kind of a move. And so for that reason, I think it cools off. It doesn't mean we don't believe in EVs. I think it's just a normalization in terms of what the market is pricing in relative to what's actually happening. Agree. And I, uh, a second or an additional prediction that relates to that is delivery numbers for Tesla, Rivian, and uh, Lucid. Uh, we think that Tesla is going to deliver somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3 million vehicles in 2022. I think it's going to be closer to 1.3. Uh, the street is at 1.2 million uh, today. In the case of Rivian, the street's around 42,000. We think that they'll come below that. And with Lucid, the street's at around 22,000. And we think that it will come in uh, below that as well. The reason for the misses uh, related to Rivian and Lucid is this production hell that Elon described in 2017 when they were starting to ramp uh, production of Model 3. We all remember that so well. Uh, Rivian and Lucid will be going through that uh, next year, uh, along with the headwind of all what is going on in the supply chain. So I suspect some uh, uh, adjustments in expectations early in the year related to those two delivery targets. Also in 2018, Elon uh, mentioned that it's uh, 100 times diff more difficult to build a factory than it is to build a car, and uh, they're in the midst of building factories right now. And so uh, again, think Tesla. Uh, exceeds street estimates. I think Rivian and Lucid uh, miss them. It doesn't mean that uh, Rivian and Lucid aren't going to be long-term players. They've uh, got the cash to sustain this. Uh, uh, talking 13 billion in Rivian's case, 5 billion in Lucid's case, they're burning about a billion per quarter. So they're going to be fine. They'll be around. Uh, however, uh, I think that there's some adjustments related to expectations on the delivery numbers. Uh, the uh, uh, next one, I want to. I think this is the last one we're going to talk about too, which is uh, quantum computing. Something that you've done a lot on, but the prediction is that the theme of quantum computing. We talk about EVs cooling off, so what's going to heat up in 2022? It's quantum computing, and maybe Doug, if you can start, if it's possible to do a one-on-one course on what is quantum computing. I'll try my best. Uh, and there's a lot of people out there that are much smarter than me that understand this better than I do. Uh, but the basics are this. If you think about traditional computers today, everybody's familiar with the idea of sort of binary construction. That's how our current uh, chips work. Zero or one, that's what transistors on, on a chip sort of read. And if you think about today's chips, most chips have you know, billions of transistors that are all at some state, either zero or one. And if you sort of have all of those transistors working in conjunction, you get calculations that let us record on Zoom right now. Um, and so that's a traditional binary uh, computer uh, semiconductor. What's different about quantum is if you think about that zero or one construct, binary or, or quantum completely changes that. So there's something called superposition, which a quantum transistor can essentially inhabit the same state of zero and one at the same time instead of or. So and instead of or. And what it basically does is it opens up a few things uh, in terms of speed and cost efficiency. 
there should be significant improvements. And so just from that perspective, the chips can be superior to our old age chips. But what's more exciting is that having that uh, ability to be in superposition potentially, and we'll see what happens, but potentially enables these chips, quantum chips, to perform calculations that could never be done on a traditional transistor uh, you know, uh, based semiconductor. And so that to me is really exciting. You know, 2021 was this year really where we paid a lot of attention to the semiconductor supply issues. Things have been constrained. It's uh, caused prices to change. It's caused uh, even automotive to be very constrained in terms of deliveries. Um, but I think 2022, we think more about where semiconductors are going and less about supply. And I think that that is quantum. And when you talk about doing some uh, calculations that haven't been done before, am, am I taking the bait here by saying that uh, this impacts uh, machine learning and uh, all the kind of the long-term hope that that eventually could be? It's possible, yeah. And it, it's what's really challenging with it is so much of it is theoretical until we have you know some chips, I think, running at scale uh, and having you know, developers, which which always is what is the unlock for any platform when you get developers and all of the creativity, all of the uniqueness of ideas that they bring to a new technology. I think that's where you start to really see compelling innovation. We're not really there yet. We're still very early in quantum, um, but theoretically, again, kind of back to your point. I mean, it it could be everything from uh, you know novel medicines that we invent through new uh, computing paradigms. It could be AI, it could crack uh, anything along those lines, these really challenging calculations that we're doing on basically uh, transistors that just aren't really built for those calculations at scale at least. And then on the energy efficient side, because it can do more calculations more efficiently, I guess that they would run cooler and just take up less juice too. Uh, they can do bigger jobs too, which take up more juice, but in theory, this should be more efficient from an uh, energy consumption standpoint, correct? In theory, and that's one of the major selling points. I think that these companies, there's a couple that are public right now, one called IonQ and one called Rigetti, which is, uh, both of them are actually SPACs. Uh, IonQ has completed its SPAC, so it's, it's fully public. Rigetti is engaged in a SPAC transaction that I think is supposed to complete sometime the first half of next year. But those are the selling points right now, some of the major selling points from both of those companies. That's correct. Uh, I was remiss to mention we are not investors in IonQ or Rigetti. We are investors in Facebook. Should have mentioned that earlier in uh, the conversation. And I guess when you, you put all this together, some big companies in there too, uh, Google, Microsoft, is this going to kind of be the same thing we saw in EVs where, uh, or what we could see in the metaverse where uh, these little companies make some noise for a short amount of time, but really the substance of what's going to go on in quantum is going to come from the bigger companies? Uh, it's hard to tell. I think we'll see. I think that, uh, again, we're, we're not investors to your point, and so I don't want to uh, offer any recommendations specific to these companies. I do think that uh, Rigetti has some interesting technology that seems different and novel than some of the other approaches out there. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I think there will be multiple people who sort of play in this game. But if history is any indication, you look at NVIDIA dominated GPUs, AMD was really a second run. Intel dominated CPUs, again, AMD was really kind of a second run there. Um, it usually seems that one major player emerges from whatever the, the technological paradigm is. And so I don't know if that'll be a Rigetti or an IonQ or a Google or IBM or someone else will figure it out. But I think you'd probably have to bet on one technology really winning out and then that company probably being a very significant company. Love it. It's going to be a fun theme. If it doesn't get going in 2022, it's a function of time before this theory reaches uh, practice. Uh, right. Doug, time thank is you. arbitrary. feels time very quantum, arbitrary. quantum oh, relevant. Well, uh, it is arbitrary. It's relevant. We do mark it, uh, marking the year today and also uh, marking a, a milestone for Loop. Loop turns five years old on January 1st, and happy birthday, Loop. Happy on behalf birthday, of Doug, uh, Andrew, uh, we've had a ton of fun building this together, and on behalf of Loop TV, bye for now.